Good morning. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Howe uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest BetaShares Academy webinar for today. We're going to be going through a discussion about building better portfolios with asset allocation and our presenter today is Blair Modica, a director in our advisor services business. Uh, a reminder today that we will just be talking general in nature um, and we're not actually taking into account any personal circumstances. For everyone joining us today and also uh, for people who have registered, we will be sending out a recording of the session to all attendees. You'll get a recording of the session and also a copy of the slides. Throughout the session, if you have any questions for Blair at the end or any comments that you would like to make, please do so by just uh, highlighting the question mark and then typing your question on the right hand side. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have and we'll try and get to as many as possible at the end of the session. Throughout uh, this period that uh, we, we are all going through at the moment, um, BetaShares is really committed to education and insight and we are producing uh, our regular content and also uh, some special commentary. We have a navigating the uh, virus crisis webinar series, which is fortnightly with our chief economist. Uh, and David is also writing a number of global economic pieces. We also uh, have our regular insights blog, which is on a newsletter on a Wednesday. And David writes his Monday morning piece. Um, and that is uh, a, a sort of snapshot of the week. So please go to our website. And if there is, uh, there's an opportunity to sign up there. So just moving on, I would like to introduce Blair um, and hand it over to him. Um, Blair Modica, a director in our advisor services, as I said. Um, Blair works across our Victorian and Tasmania regions and I'm delighted to welcome Blair today. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today for this uh, this webinar on asset allocation and, and asset classes. It's, it's really good to be with you and, and thank you all for making the time given the circumstances. Please bear with us uh, if there are any issues with sound quality. We will look to get them fixed. Obviously, working remotely it can be a little bit difficult, but we don't anticipate any issues at this point in time. Um, so look, as Sarah said a little bit about me, I've been with Beta Shares for three years now. Um, and primarily responsible for distribution in our wealth channels, uh, as well as the retail market. So um, look, hopefully some of the information you get today is, uh, is useful for you. Um, I guess just to get started, just, just a little bit of information on beta shares um, in case you, you aren't familiar with us as a brand. We've got the widest range of exchange traded funds uh, or products in Australia at 61 and just over $10 billion in assets under management. Uh, BetaShares is the only Australian founded and managed ETF provider and I guess why that's important for, for you as individual investors is, is probably twofold. First of all, there's no need for any paperwork so uh, a lot of issues that, that people come across with when investing in ETFs is, is the WA Ben forms when investing in the US. There, there's simply no need for that. All of our funds are Australian domicile. Um, our objective is to expand the universe of investment possibilities open to investors in Australia. And again, I guess harking back to that Australian founded uh, nature, our, our products are designed with the interests of Australian investors in mind. And why that's important is our portfolio management team is based in Sydney. We're not badging any US or European product. We're designing it all in Australia for the Australian investor. And again, all of our funds are traded on the ASX or the Australian Securities Exchange. They deliver simple access to a broad range of market indices and asset classes. But just to talk to the, the growth of the global ETF industry. Um, so taking a step back, what does that look like? Um, and I guess the chart here shows the growth of the global ETF industry. So at this point in time, around $6.3 trillion under management to the end of 2019. Uh, but growing at a really, really fast pace, so 25% um, from the end of, of 2018. 
So the dip at the end of 2018, you can see there uh, on the chart, is due to that market pullback from October of that year. Um, and I guess looking at the, the large increase in 2019, that's down to market recovery. And then again, increasing popularity in ETFs, leading to a large increase in assets under management over 2019. And we've certainly seen that continue into 2020, albeit the, uh, the pullback in the, in the market. So now looking at Australia, I guess there's a couple of things that, that stand out pretty quickly. Um, we, we can see that growth's outpacing the rest of the world with a compound annual growth rate of 45% per annum. As I said, obviously given the recent market movement, we've seen a pullback, but ETFs have remained hugely popular as a trading mechanism during the market instability, and they've operated ex exactly as they should, and that's, that's the really key part to get from that. To December 2019, the market had grown to $61.8 billion in funds under management in Australia. And I guess that's that's impressive growth when you look at it, given it was a, a base of zero only 19 years ago. And I, I guess we put the growth down to awareness and, and comfort with the ETF structure in Australia now. More and more people are comfortable. They've, they've used it for many years, um, as well as the large range of asset classes and strategies that are now available. And obviously, beta shares at the, the forefront of that with the, the most investments available in the market at, at 71. So today, just as an overview of the agenda, what will I be covering? First of all, what is an ETF? So some really basic 101 on, on what an exchange traded fund is. And I certainly encourage you to um, ask any questions and I'll, I'll cover them at the end on, on basic ETF structure. I'll then touch on asset allocation, so ingredients that can be used to optimise portfolios and, and certainly your portfolios, and then ways to calibrate portfolios using asset allocation. So what are some different tips or tricks in terms of getting the right optimisation with your portfolio? And I, I hope that that's quite interesting for you. So let's start with what is an ETF? And, and I guess there's five key points here. The first being they're open-ended, so um, you know there's no close date in terms of the investment they go on for forever. Um, they're exchange traded, so unlike I guess listed managed funds or sorry unlisted managed funds, you can trade them on the exchange. You get up-to-date net asset value of every second of the day. Uh, they, they typically track an index or employ rules-based strategies. So if you if you look on the news at night and you see the ASX 200, the Dow Jones, or the Nasdaq. They're indexes, and, and a lot of ETFs look to, I, I guess, track those indexes and, and, and give you wide market exposure. They can be both passive or, or, or active, so that beta shares were the first to release active ETFs into the market, um, and I guess that's just building on, on technology and, and, and what we're able to do these days in terms of offering out quality investments. Look, as I said before, they're, they're bought and sold on the ASX, so no surprises there. It's important to note that ETFs are subject to the same rules and regulations as managed funds as stipulated by ASIC. So cover exactly the same stipulations there. And they allow investors to access markets which traditionally have been difficult to access. So in general, that allows for a democratisation of access to funds and the funds management industry in general. Now more than ever, now more than ever before, investors are able to access a wide array of investment ideas and, and, and market at lower prices than what uh, what we've seen traditionally. Um, so I guess in general now there's more available at increasingly lower costs. Now I guess ETPs in general they're, they're an evolution in technology, and and we've really seen that throughout our, our daily lives anyway. I mean you look at the telephone 30 years ago, it was wired into our house. Now we're using the iPhone. Now, books have gone from, from very much being an individual thing that you pick up to now being able to download hundreds on a Kindle and, and, and read them at any time you like. CDs, again, were all the rage in the early 90s. Uh, that, that sort of developed into MP3s, and now we pick up our smartphones and access our songs via Spotify or, or Apple Music. Um, and, and, and very much the same for computers as well. You know, it used to be hardwired, large, um, large pieces of equipment. And now they're getting smaller and smaller and we can take them anywhere with wireless technology. ETFs are much the same. So they're the new evolution of the funds management industry. Um, they allow investors the ability to access markets and, and strategy and strategies that were previously difficult or, or really impossible to, to access. 
So in, in terms of the advantages of ETFs, uh, I guess pretty simple to, to understand. Um, first of all, they're, they're cost effective. So generally, because we're tracking the index um, or an asset class, there's no built-in active management fees to worry about, and therefore they're, they're reasonably cost effective when, when investing. In terms of diversification, as I was touching on before, in a single trade, you can access the wider market. So to take, for example, the ASX 200, they're the top 200 listed companies available in the market and available in one single trade, which makes it very easy to access a diversified portfolio, again, at a low cost. They're, they're easy to access, and, and what I mean by that is they're traded on the ASX, which means as an investor, you can log onto your Comsec account, E-Trade, Westpac, whatever it is, and be able to trade them just as you would be able to trade a stock, a single stock in the market. They're transparent, and, and what I mean by that is if you log onto the BetaShares website at, at any point in the day, you'll be able to find out what is uh, consisting of the portfolio. So for the ASX 200, you'll see a list of the top 200 securities. I will add that with our active funds, they do run in arrears given some of the IP um, that, that goes into that, but certainly you can see what is in the portfolio at any one time. And look, as I've said before, there's, there's lots of choice available. So it really, the market started off a few years ago with those broad-based index trackers, the S&P, ASX 200, things like that. It's now developed into you know, truly international exposure. You can get the NASDAQ, European indexes, emerging markets. And then focus on thematics as well, whether that's global cyber security, global energy, um, or, or even buying commodities. And I'll, I'll touch on these things a little bit later on. The other advantage I wanted to touch on just finally is liquidity. Um, and, and there is some, I guess, misnomers about ETFs in the market that perhaps they aren't liquid. What I'd, what I'd like to say about that is you're as, you're as liquid as your least liquid stock in the portfolio. Now, if we think of something like the ASX 200, obviously the top 200 uh, stocks in the country are, are traded very heavily. And therefore, as, a, as any managed fund, the, the ETF is very, very liquid. You shouldn't have any concerns with respect to liquidity. So in terms of the exchange traded product evolution, I touched on the fact that you know 20 years ago there was you know, no funds under management in Australia and that, that's grown significantly over time. But how have the, the, the products changed over that time? And it's probably an, an interesting point. I think we think of exchange traded products typically as that index weighted by market capitalization that I've touched on. And certainly there's 31 beta shares funds that cover that. And, and the prime example is A200. So the top 200 listed in Australia by market capitalization, but certainly X20 removing the top 20 stocks from the market and buying 21 to 200, or, or an index like QFN, which tracks the, uh, the financial index in Australia. Then there was ETF or, or ETP 1.5. And I guess that aims to track an index that's not weighted by market capitalization. So again, nine beta shares funds there, examples, QOs, QUS and CRED. I'll certainly touch on them later in the presentation. Rules-based strategies, again, 12 beta shares funds. So building on, on a rules-based process to achieve an optimum outcome. Um, and there's some examples there. One that's been used quite heavily over the past few weeks is BEAR. Uh, which is a short fund designed to give you one for one performance as the market goes down. Um, actively managed portfolio investments, so ETP 3.0, which we've seen a lot of interest in over the last probably two years. Examples of that in the beta shares suite, actively managed hybrids, uh, actively managed fixed income, and also the RINC fund, which is real assets. But just touching again on exchange traded products, and, and I guess they encompass the whole features of the, the funds management industry. So if you look at an unlisted active fund, you, you look at lower costs, well, they're, they're not really ticking the box in terms of uh, lower costs given their active IP strategies. They do trade near their net asset, net asset value, but they're not traded on the ASX. Uh, in terms of unlisted managed funds, certainly lower cost. They trade near their NAV, but, but they don't trade on the ASX. And then if you look at listed investment companies uh, or, or listed investment trusts, certainly they, they do charge a higher fee. They do tend to, to trade at a discount or a premium to their net asset value, which can be problematic when you're trying to buy and sell for a fair price, but they are traded on the ASX. If we then look at exchange traded products, certainly ticking all three boxes. So as I've said, lower cost, tick there, trading near its NAV. So certainly it ticks the box there, it trades Plus or minus a small spread to its net asset value, which is handy when you want to get in and out. 
um, and certainly traded on the ASX, so available on your, your ComSec or, or whatever brokerage account that you do use. So just moving on in terms of asset allocation, which I guess is the crux of the presentation today, let's look at the ingredients that can be used to optimise portfolios. So first of all, just a little, a, a little quote, you should have a strategic asset allocation mix that assumes that you don't know what the future is going to hold. And that's by Ray Dalio. So he's an American billionaire investor. You may have heard of him, hedge fund manager and founder of Bridgewater Associates, which is, uh, which is one of the world's largest hedge funds and, and very, very successful. I guess why I put this here is it really cuts to the point of why asset allocation is important. It allows us to create a portfolio that can perform in all different kinds of markets. And if we look at the recent market volatility, there, there's a reason why that's important. Things are going down, you need to have a buffer in terms of protecting your portfolio when volatility, I guess, comes into the market and, and protecting yourself from wider market drawdowns. In order to explain asset allocation, we must first, I guess, define what an asset class is. An asset class contains investments that have similar characteristics. They're expected to have similar risks and returns and also perform in a similar manner in particular market conditions. Each different asset class is expected to reflect different risk and return characteristics, think equities versus bonds, and perform differently in different market conditions. So here you can see that by mixing different asset classes, we can try to optimise our asset allocation. So what type of different asset classes are there? I'm sure you're aware of a few, but, um, but certainly these are, are some of the different asset classes available. So property is an asset class, Australian equity is certainly an asset class, um, but then you think about equity income, so deriving income from your equities, that's an, uh, an asset class. Currency, so taking a currency view, whether it's the US dollar, euro or pound, is an asset class. Um, cash and fixed income, really important as a defensive type of strategy and, and an asset, asset class. You can now invest ethically, um, there's certainly commodities available, gear funds, hybrids, so, so really there's plenty of different asset classes available. They're not all correlated with each other and that gives us an opportunity to be able to optimise our portfolios. So the chart on this slide shows the benefits of incorporating different asset classes into the asset allocation mix. So on the right you'll see the graded colour scale shows the best and worst performing asset classes for any given year. Green being best, red being worst. In any one year, we can see that not all asset classes perform in the same manner. In fact, they're quite different, representing different fundamentals and, and different economic conditions. If we look at 2019, for example, whilst all asset classes were positive, some performed better than others. And you can certainly see that on the slide. So if we look at the, the market volatility in 2020, you want a well-diversified portfolio to protect you from market instability. If you, look at the, uh, if you look at the year 2008, the GFC, you can see that bonds helped to offset some of the significant losses of the equities market. This is an extreme example, but it shows the power of asset allocation and having a well diversified portfolio across different asset classes. So getting the asset allocation right isn't easy, but it is clear that diversifying through asset classes goes a long way to optimising your portfolios. So to dig a little deeper, what is asset allocation? Well, it combines a few different aspects. So blending exposure to different investments, which we just discussed through asset classes. Calibration, so picking, picking a risk return profile to match an investor's needs. So conservative to high growth, and that'll change throughout your life cycle. Enhanced risk adjusted returns. So the idea that is the, sorry, the idea is by diversifying, an investor gets a benefit, and that being reduced risk at, a, at no loss in returns. To relate to asset allocation, just to use some everyday terms, so it, it's like wine, blending two wines with different characteristics can allow a broader range of wine styles. So if you look at blending sweeter Merlot with a drier Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the grapes can result in a better balanced wine flavour that can be adjusted, adjusted for different tastes and certainly portfolios are very similar. You look at a seasonal business, so investing in a business that caters for tastes at different times of year, I, I guess pivoting like we're seeing with the recent coronavirus here, hot soup versus ice cream sellers. So investing in two businesses that do well at different times of the year can smooth out the overall re revenues over the year. 
So choosing a level of preferred risk is part of asset allocation. So we're able to vary our weights to different asset classes, which allows us to optimise or set a level of comfort in terms of how much, how much risk we're taking on. Where we have asset classes that are not perfectly correlated, we can construct portfolios that can maximise returns given a certain level of risk. And I'll certainly touch on this over the next few slides. So here are a couple of examples of asset classes which aren't perfectly correlated. So you look at equities versus bonds, and again, I will explain this over the next few slides, but bonds have generally tended to do well when equities perform poorly, as interest rates tend to drop during market sell-offs. And then Australian versus international equities. So Australia is top heavy in resources and financials, we probably all know, but low in exposure to technology. So over the next few slides, we'll explain this a little bit further. So Australian fixed rate bonds give you handy negative correlation to equities markets. So on this chart, we're showing you the ASX 200 equity index returns versus the Osborne Composite Bond Index returns. What you can see quite quickly is that returns are very different over yearly periods, which really isn't surprising given that they're two very different asset classes. But in general, there's an inverse relationship when equities markets draw down, Negative correlation is how we'd put that. But the best example on the chart is that December 2008, the global financial crisis. So what you're seeing there is the S&P ASX 200 equity index drew down almost 40% or, or had a 40% reduction in its value. But what did the Osborne Composite Index do? It was actually up by around 18%. So quickly you can see that by... Um, by diversifying your portfolio, you're able to weather in some respects the storm of an equity market drawdown by invest, investing in cash and fixed income. I guess to put it a different way, you look at Australia, top heavy resources and financials, but light exposure to technology. So if you look at this chart here, you've got the NASDAQ 100, the S&P 500 and the ASX 200. And what you can see pretty quickly is the NASDAQ 100 is heavy in sectors that the ASX 200 isn't. If you look at consumer discretionary, which encompasses companies like Apple, 14.7% in the NASDAQ 100, only 16, sorry, only 6.7% in the ASX 200. The big one is information technology, 47.4% on the NASDAQ 100. With FANG stocks, Apple, Netflix, Google, these type of companies, 47.4% compared to 2.5% in Australia. Communication services, namely being Facebook, so this is a new sector within the NASDAQ. Facebook split off into communication services, 20.9% in the NASDAQ, only 3.6% of the ASX 200. So quickly you can see by splitting the investment mix, Investors are able to diversify their portfolios or, or themselves out of one market, but also diversify into sectors which aren't developed in Australia, thus managing risk, risk across different fields. Finally, I just wanted to touch on some ways to calibrate portfolios using asset allocation. So you can see here, I'm, I'm going to run through a couple of different ways exchange traded funds can be used to calibrate or, or construct portfolios. The first being a core satellite strategy. So that's a, a classic strategy. Using ETFs as your core broad based index tracking fixed income ETFs like A200, Coupon and Cred as the mainstay of your portfolio. And then perhaps a satellite exposures such as sector size equity ETFs. So you might be looking at global energy or global healthcare single country or, or regional equity ETFs, you may even look at emerging markets there, something like India, um, active funds and certainly the partnership with both Coolabar Capital and, uh, and, and Leg Mason, give plenty of actively managed funds, whether that's the real income or equity income funds or, or hybrid. You may want to use hedge funds, alternative ETFs or, or really even individual stock selection as that satellite type approach. So, that's one way to, to optimise your portfolio and, and really use ETP as well. Another is a building block approach using ETP. So we see people using that to calibrate their portfolio um, and at a low cost. So I'll talk about some of the individual strategies in front of you over the next couple of slides. But the table we have here is a demonstration of how these funds can be mixed together as building blocks to form a diversified portfolio. So you can see that by mixing together 11 different ETFs, we are able to construct a balanced portfolio with 45% defensive, 50% growth, and a 5% allocation to gold as an alternative. So this is a demonstration of a balanced portfolio. 
To talk to the specific funds, I'll start with the defensive allocation. And, and, and the defensive strategies I've got here are all available within the beta shares suite. So cash, floating rate note bonds through coupon, fixed rate corporate bonds through cred, and hybrids. And what, what our fixed income funds do is pay distributions monthly and give you a defensive allocation that you're able to mix and match to really optimise, say, the, the Osborn Composite or Fixed Rate Index um, to, to get a better outcome. So by mixing, say, cred and coupon, you're getting a good mixture of floating rate and fixed rate bonds and managing your risk. To touch on that a little bit further with AAA Cash, AAA Cash is basically at call cash as an ETF, again, paying distributions monthly. And at the moment, at this moment in time, it's paying 0.75% net of all fees. Now, when you compare that to the, uh, the interest rates at the moment at 15 basis points, you're getting a, a quite significant pickup in that rate. If you compare it to, I guess, bank deposits and term deposits, you can see in the chart in front of you, it is quite compelling. So average uh, one-year term deposit only playing 0.99%. Compare that to 0.75 for the, the high cash interest ETF, you're getting T plus two liquidity on the, uh, on, on the ETF. A one-month term deposit only 0.34. RBA cash rate, as I said, 0.25, uh, a, a wrap or, or savings account, 0.4, and, and the average online broker cash account, 0.01. So quickly you can see that 0.75 is, uh, is quite a pickup in terms of the cash rate, T plus two liquidity there. This is a, a hypothetical comparison with respect to our A200 fund. It's the lowest cost Australian ETF in the world at seven basis points. So. As you can see on the chart, the investor makes an initial investment of $10,000 that grows in real terms by 5% per annum. Over 40 years, the initial investment will be worth $42,116 in today's dollars if the investor had paid the average Australian active investment management fee of 1.34% per annum. If the investor had paid a 200s 0.7 management fee with the same pre-fee investment performance, their investment would have been worth 68,547 over the same period. So 65% more return just by factoring in fees, which is quite significant. Just talking about, I guess, a rules-based or smart beta strategy uh, that, that is optimising Australian equities or smarter indexing, we've got QIs here, so QOZ, sorry, QOZ, which is the ticket code, rating a company based on its economic size. So sales, cash flow, dividends and book value of a company, rather than looking at a stock based, by, based on their market capitalisation or price. So what you're seeing there is around about a 2% outperformance per annum on top of the ASX 200 index. Talking about quality now, given uncertainty, better to be positioned in a portfolio of high quality global companies uh, with lower debt, higher earning certainty and strong profitability. With BetaShares Global Quality Leaders, there's a natural tilt to healthcare of 33% and technology stocks at 23% with lower allocations uh, with lower allocations of consumer discretionary, 12%, financial, 7%, and real estate, 1% in particular. So if we look at this chart here in particular, you can see, firstly, the arrows in red, we can see at the start of the GFC through the first half of 08, global quality leaders index drawdown is roughly in line with the broader market. And a similar pattern is born out of the current virus crisis, with quality in the broader world index both drawing down approximately 20% in Aussie dollar terms. Often we see this increase in correlation at the initial stages of a market shock as investors look for the doors and all risk assets fall together. However, after the GFC market shock, we can see that the quality index has a max drawdown of only about half that of the broader market and, a quality, and quality starts to recover far earlier and faster. Now, that we, now the reasons for this may be that investors come to the realisation that not all stocks are equal, start to differentiate and gravitate towards those with strong return on equity lower earnings volatility and lower debt. The quality is a fund which screens companies based on their, uh, their, their return on equity as a quality company. So their, their score is a quality company. Essentially the main factor, as I said, we use is a high return on equity, but sustainable return on equity as well. Um, and that's over the individual securities. So that's demonstrated a long running outperformance over stocks which do not have this quality. Another one I wanted to touch on, and we touched on it briefly before, but NASDAQ. So yeah, I guess access to a new economy. So you see here strong performance over many years, 
But given the market pullback recently represents a good opportunity as tech companies are somewhat immune to COVID-19 related slowdowns. Look at Netflix and Facebook as an example. We're still using these companies every day despite being stuck inside. And so you can see there as well the diversification benefits from being diversified from the ASX 200 or the MSCI world, just giving you a different return profile. Well, so just, just this chart is a little bit out of date, but the message holds true. Gold gives you a, a different to traditional correlation metric, metric, so it's an alternative allocation. Our, our, our gold ETF 2AU, the ticket code, is currency hedge, which is we feel where you want to be in this environment, and it's given you a, a different correlation to equity. So the, the ETF itself holds physical gold and will track the, uh, the price of spot gold. Another one I wanted to touch on is our, our fixed income fund CRED, which is Australian corporate investment grade fixed income. And uh, I guess touching on what we spoke about before, that negative correlation to equities markets. So by return metric, when you compare it to not only the ASX 200, but the ASX 200 Osborn composite blend, with significantly lower overall volatility. So if you had a mixture of the, uh, the S&P ASX 200 and CRED, the volatility would have been about 8.4% compared to the S&P ASX 200 alone at 17.5%. So, and then you look at the, the return, 6.3% versus 3.8. So a good way to diversify and just change that risk return metric. So the last thing I wanted to mention on calibration was the blending of active and passive strategies to achieve a lower cost base. The first two funds you see here are an all active portfolio. And you see there the, the, the management fee of 1.25%. We've then got an active and passive portfolio. And you can see by blending a, an active fund with a global equities fund such as NASDAQ, you can really lower that, that management fee um, significantly. So 0.86% in this example. So by blending the ETF passive portfolio with similar, similar characteristics, um, so, so, so say, NAS, say NASDAQ as an example versus a global equities manager, we're able to reduce the cost base significantly while chasing similar performance. So this can have a profound difference on overall returns over time, as we discussed earlier. And just finally, if you wanted to purchase a portfolio which does all the work for you, we have diversified funds available in a one-click, one-trade process. So here you can see there are four different blends available, from conservative up to high growth. They're available under the ticket codes DZZF, DBBF, DGGF, DHHF, and we'll give you different types of asset allocation depending on your risk appetite. I'll touch on these quickly over the next couple of slides, but these follow strategic asset allocation guidelines and are re rebalanced yearly. So at 26 basis points, these exposures represent a low cost way to access a, uh, a quality portfolio. I'll run, and as I said, I'll run through the underlying investments over the next couple of slides. So you see, if you look at the balanced diversified ETF, the DBBF ticker code, some of the funds included in there AAA with beta shares, coupon, cred, but we also mix in a best of breed. So we mix in Vanguard and State Street as well. So you'll see the Vanguard Global Aggregate Bond Fund as a defensive play. And then you see in the, the growth options, A200, the beta shares, A200 ETF, seven basis points, Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF listed in the, on the New York Stock Exchange, the, the Spider Portfolio, so State Street Developed World and Emerging Market Index, so you can see that a good mixture of not just beta shares ETFs, giving you a, a really good diversified portfolio at a low cost. Um, and, and so who might these funds suit? If you look at the diversified conservative in income ETF, income focused investors, investment time frame of at least five years and a low tolerance for risk. You move up to balanced, again, investment time frame of five years and a medium tolerance for risk with growth, you're looking at an investment time frame of seven years, medium to high risk tolerance, and then diversified high growth, at least seven years and a high tolerance for risk, so perhaps a younger investor. Now, how can individual or SMSF investors use the beta, for, beta shares diversified ETFs? They can be used as a low cost core um, uh, of your personal SMSF portfolio and complement with additional satellite investments. You can set up a diversified portfolio for children, grandchildren or others starting their investment journey or use as a cost-effective, scalable, all-in-one investment solution that provides exposure to a carefully blended portfolio. 
And you'll see here doing just as they're designed to do if you, are, if you look at their simulated historical performance. So look, just I guess that's it in terms of content for the, uh, the presentation today, but certainly things to keep in mind. Obviously, all investments have risk. All the advice today has been general information in uh, general information only. We will make these slides available, so please I encourage you to go through all of them. Um, and if you have any further questions off the back of today, please contact our social channels. We're more than happy to reach out and um, and give you some help there. So that's it from me. We'll pause for a couple of minutes just to tally the questions, and then we'll come back to you and answer answer them. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Blair. Um, that was great. Look, I think with uh, just over five minutes left of the session, I think we might get straight into the questions. Um, there's been quite a few, and unfortunately, we won't get to every question today, but there's just been some really fantastic um, questions that have come through. Now, one really important one, um, Blair, if you could please explain, how are the fees taken out of the ETFs? Yeah, that's a really good question. So essentially the way that works, if you look at that 0.07% management fee on our A200 ETF, what you do is really divide that by the number of days in the year. And essentially that will come off the net asset value every day. So you, you won't notice it with, with market movement, but essentially that's the way we collect the fees there. Great. Uh, a, another one is, what does it mean to trade near the NAV, net asset value? Yeah, so what that means is the net asset value is inherently what the fund is worth and, and that's what you want to be paying for the fund at any one time. Now, unlike LICs or, or LITs, which can trade at a significant discount or, or premium, given the way the fund structure works, ETFs are, are quite different and, and, and the market maker, makers are actually obliged to keep a very tight spread on that net asset value. Um, and it won't deviate from that. So you're getting net asset value um, plus or minus a very tight spread, which accounts for the market makers covering their fees and costs on uh, providing the, the portfolio or ETF in the market. Okay, great. Um, the, a question on uh, a good process when deciding between ETFs. Uh, so, you know, and, and I, I said at the start of the presentation that our website certainly is a great source for education insight uh, and our fund pages have a lot of material on them. Um, if you are doing your research and investigating, do you have anything anything to add to that, Blair? Yeah, look, I think it's a good question and certainly I think the, the most important part is do your research. A few of the things I'd look at in particular would be price. Um, but then, you know, price isn't, isn't necessarily going to be the only factor in, in choosing an ETF. You should look at the performance, but, but also look at the underlying investment strategy and make sure that that, I guess, matches up with what you're looking to achieve from the investment. So if you want market exposure, but just pure market cap, certainly price is going to be the main thing you look at. If, if you're looking for a, a more, I guess, esoteric blend of investments, um, we really need to dig under the bonnet and see how the fund works, not just look at performance when, when deciding what to invest in. Okay, great. Um, and this question's come up a, a few times actually. How, how do I actually get started? How do I invest in a beta shares fund? Yeah, really good question. Um, so if you've got a brokerage account, whether it's with Comsec or, or whoever else, you can go on our website and look at the ticket codes. I mean, I touched on a few of them, AAA cash, A200 for, for Australian equities market exposure. You type that into your brokerage account and buy and sell just like you would any, any stock on the stock exchange. So it's as simple as that. Um, and essentially you're buying a managed fund that, that is listed on the stock exchange um, and, and doing some of the heavy lifting for you. Great. Uh, and is it possible to buy and sell an ETF in the same day? Absolutely. So you can, yeah, absolutely. I think, look, the beta shares suite is set up very well for, for strategies that, that do incorporate that. I mean, you may want to put on a, a short trade, say in bear, um, that, that tracks the, the market performance when it goes down and, and, and gives you a positive performance in terms of dollars. So you may want to sell that at the end of the day and take some profit off the table and you're, you're absolutely able to do that. So the ETFs in our suite certainly have up to, the, uh, up to date, up to minutes, net asset value pricing. So you'll be able to see what the fund is worth at any one time and, and make an investment decision off the back of that. So you will be able to sell in, in market hours at, at any point. 
Okay, that's great. Blair, I think um, we are at time and I think we will finish up there. I think it's been a really great, uh, a great overall introduction to asset allocation and, and sort of ways that you can think about building your portfolios with the BetaShares suite of uh, exchange traded products. Really thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and as I mentioned we have an ongoing series of uh, webinars with David Bassanese talking about the uh, economic impact, market outlook and some investment ideas during the virus crisis. Uh, and then we also have another BetaShares Academy session coming up next month. We'll be talking about some tips um, and things to keep in mind when you are actually trade uh, investing in, in uh, our funds. So we would love to, to see you there as well. Thank you very much, Blair. Great presentation and we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, look, thank you everyone for tuning in. Obviously, given the uh, the difficult period that we're going th uh, through, I hope everyone's well and I uh, really appreciate you, you tuning in. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bye.